First, we're actually going to take a little bit of a deviation. We're actually going to talk about the bubonic plague first. Uh, it's a particularly interesting topic for those of you that are interested in the medical field or if you're interested in history like I am. Um, many of you may have saw this article late last year, uh, published in CNN, and published in a bunch of different uh, news outlets across the globe. Uh, the two people got this got the Black Plague in China. And yes, it is the Black Plague. So what's going on here and what is the Black Plague or the Black Death? Well, it, as for many of you, you might know, is it was a major pandemic in the 1300s. It started in Central Asia and arrived in Europe in 1347, and it was carried by a fleet of merchant vessels. Um, once it hit Europe, it killed between 75 and 200 million people, which at the time was about 30 to 50 percent of Europe's population. And it actually took Europe about 200 years for the population to recover. Um, this, this, this disease, this plague, was caused by Yersinia pestis, and it was actually discovered in the late 1800s by Alexander Yersin, aptly named Yersinia pestis after him. It is a gram-negative, non-motile, rod-shaped bacterium. And so for those of you that like uh, sort of the things we've been talking about with metabolism, it is a gamma proteobacterium. It is a non-spore former. It is negative for urease, lactose formation, as well as indole production. And overall, it is a facultative anaerobe, so meaning it has the capacity to grow with and without oxygen. One of the things it does, it actually puts what we call an antiphagocytic slime layer. And just to break down that word, anti meaning against, and then phagocytic against your phagocytes in your immune system. So the part of your immune system that engulfs and consumes bacteria to kill them. This layer that they produce of slime helps them evade immune defenses and helps them produce several different uh, cytotoxic uh, compounds. Um, but Yersinia, Yersinia pestis infections take three forms, the bubonic, septicemic, and pneumonic plagues. Well, maybe not the plagues, but diseases. Um, all these forms can be accompanied by fever and systematic manifestation of sepsis, which you know, typically is formed, which typically uh, is shown as exhaustion and lightheadedness. So the bubonic plague is the one we think about when we think about Yersinia pestis. It is the most common form and the cause of the Black Plague epidemic that swept Europe. It has a sudden onset of fever, chills, and weakness, and is distinguished by the, the presence of bubo, which is one or more uh, enlarged, tendered regional lymph nodes. Um, they're typically in the groin or the neck, um, and it's typically the, uh, the lymph node that is closest to the bite of the flea, because as we'll discuss, this, this bacteria is transmitted via fleas. Um, and so you might have seen uh, these bubonic plagues. They form, they form these really sort of massive lumps when the uh, individuals are infected with this bacteria. Um, if this bacteria is not treated very quickly, it will rapidly spread to other parts of the body and cause septicemic or pneumonic plague. Septicemic plague is when a bacteria enters and multiplies inside the blood. And typically when uh, a bacteria enters your blood system, you're sort of toast. Um, once it goes systemic, it's really hard to get rid of a, a large scale bacterial infection. It's much more easy to treat something that say only in your lungs or on your skin. But uh, once it's in your blood, skin and other tissues will start to turn black and die. Um, this is particularly on, uh, noticeable on your appendages, including your fingers, toes, as well as your nose. Um, you typically have pretty severe gastrointestinal issues, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. And then finally, the systemic plague can quickly cause shock, internal bleeding, and organ failure, quickly leading to death. And it's pretty commonly seen where you have these really sort of uh, necrotic and black looking appendages. It's uh, that's where it gets its uh, name from as being the black plague because of the black pustules that it produces. And then finally, the pneumonic plague, it occurs when the bacteria infects the lungs. And these things are very uh, symptoms wise, mimic very closely to something like a pneumonia, uh, labored breathing, chest pain, cough, and then we're push, push, producing lots of bloody mucus. And um, pneumonic plague as a whole is pretty much tr always fatal if not treated essentially when it onsets. But uh, the natural reservoir for this bacteria is actually wild rodents and is typically acquired through the bites of infected fleas. So it has a sort of as a double root. You know, we talked about sort of some zoonotic diseases in the last class that have been caused by, say, consuming of tainted animal meat or, uh, or say, food that has gone bad. But uh, this one sort of has a double root. It's carried on rodents, but in particular, it's carried on the fleas of the rodents. So this bacteria has an incubation period about one to six days, and is typically contracted by handling infected animals, especially rodents, 
Um, I was thinking mo primarily about rats and squirrels, uh, prairie dogs if you're in Africa or the American Southwest, and then as well as lagomorphs, so rabbits and hares, and then as well as domestic cats, uh, with domestic cats being sort of uh, the lesser of the three uh, in terms of carrying. Uh, typically, uh, you, can you can also get the bubonic plague for close contact with uh, patients that are experiencing the pneumonic plague. Essentially, you inhale droplets from the cough of an infected person. However, person-to-person -person transmission is very, very rare. Um, the last reported case, case of person-to-person -person transmission was in 1925 in the United States. But this is something that does exist. As you noticed, it was in China. Uh, it's still something that exists in the United States. It's still something that exists across the globe, even to today. So the plague in nature has a natural reservoir. It's transmitted by fleas and cycles naturally among rodents, including squirrels, prairie dogs, uh, as well as rats. Um, the way, th the way these, uh, these organisms get to us is if, say, a flea makes it directly onto us or a flea hops on one of our our lovely pets that we have and then hops to us. So this is typically how people in the United States get the plague. And yes, people in the United States do still get the plague. So there's been approximately 1,000 to 2,000 people getting this plague every year, according to our friends at the World Health Organization. Most cases are actually reported in Central Africa and Madagascar. Um, and this is ultimately likely a conservative estimate since it doesn't actually account for unreported cases, very much like every disease. So for instance, you know, right now we're at about, about 2 million um, cases of COVID-19 as of April 7th. That is likely a, a vast, um, a vast underestimate of how many cases we have because it's very hard to sort of test everyone. Um, in the United States, we get about seven cases um, and there's a range of about one to 17 cases per year. This is having uh, caused close to 50,000 human cases during the past 20 years. And then and the plague is actually categorized currently by the World Health Organization as a re-emerging disease as we talked about in last class. So it's coming back. Um, in terms of the plague today, from 1990 to 2005, a total of 107 plague cases were reported in the United States. Uh, 81 of those are classified as primary bubonic plague, 19 were classified as primary septicemic plague, and five, and five are classified as primary pneumonic plague, and then 2% were simply not classified. Um, of those 107 cases, 10% or 11 were fatal, so it's a pretty uh, tough disease on the human body. Um, and most cases of, the, of these uh, infections actually only occur in two regions. So northern New Mexico, northern Arizona, and southern Colorado. And so that, that, asked that part of the American Southwest, as well as southern California, southern Oregon, as well as far western Nevada. So there's really two regions that we're seeing this plague occur. And as you'll see right here, it occurs sort of in two patches and pretty much nowhere else. Um, from what, from what I could find in terms of this point over here in the um, sort of the, uh, uh, the Chicago area of Illinois, it, uh, it seems to be someone that carried it from over here, but uh, it was sort of hard to find out what this one is. But the, th the sort of the key point is it's, it's alive and well in the American Southwest as well as the drier parts of California, um, because simply because this, this is a little mountain range in California right here called the Adirondacks. On the other side, it's very, very, very dry. Um, so, and this is due to just local weather patterns. So it likes to be in dry places um, in the United States, not very much else in this part of Texas where they found it is also pretty dry. Um, plague is actually really easily treatable with commonly available antibiotics, including streptomycin, doxycycline, gentamicin, and ciprofloxacin. So it is treatable if you catch it. Um, and this is the true, and this, so this makes it so that 90% of people that contract the plague um, sim are simply able to shed the plague with regular uh, antibiotic use. As with every disease's odds improve ver when you're treated very, very early. Um, that being said, septicemic and pneumonic plague survival is much lower, less than 50%. So if it progresses, um, you're less likely to survive, simply because as you should remember, um, these antibiotics need to be able to work with an immune system. And if this plague has gone septicemic or pneumonic, you're gonna have a compromised immune system. And prevention uh, is simply don't get bit by fleas, <laughs> use bug sprays, things like that. Uh, don't handle any dead animals. Um, and if you have to, use protective measures and attempt to reduce the amount of rodents and rabbits around your house and things like that. Um, 
you know, it's not really of concern now. It's, it's reemerging. Um, and luckily, it is commonly, it is treated with very many common antibiotics. Um, and it's not a particularly fast growing bacteria too, which is nice. So it's something that we can um, handle relatively easy. Um, it is reemerging, but again, it's not really something that we're thinking about going pandemic. Um, and there is no vaccine. Um, there actually is one out there, but we actually stopped using it simply because it wasn't a problem. So it's something that we have a vaccine for if it comes back in full force in the future. With that over, uh, I thought it would be a nice sort of tie-in from the last sort of couple lectures when we talked about uh, epidemics and then pandemics and to think about this sort of nasty one in the plague and how it's a potential re-emerging disease. So let's move on to symbiosis and let's talk about this really fascinating field of microbiology. So the question we'll ask is what the heck is a symbiosis? It is a close and long-term relationship between two or more different organisms. This is a term that was first used in the late 1800s. It was originally used to describe lichen, which is a symbiosis between fungi and algae or cyanobacteria. And this is a symbiosis we'll cover later in this lecture as well. Um, for those of you that have never heard of lichen or seen what a lichen is, you see them all the time. You find them growing on rocks, you find them growing on pavements, sides of buildings, trees. These are everywhere. Um, so you've seen a lichen before. Most likely it looks like this very common type of lichen, but they can, be look, they can look really, really cool and take much more uh, fancy shapes and colors um, in natural systems. But you've seen a lichen, um, you probably just didn't know what it was at the time. But now you know. Now you know. Um, so uh, symbiosis was originally used to describe uh, a cases where both, benef both uh, organisms were benefited through the relationship. Um, this is actually now what we call just a mutualism. And we'll, we'll talk about how this definition has been expanded um, to uh, reach a consensus that took about 130 years to describe symbiosis as really any type of interactions. But um, a symbiosis does capture all long-term reactions. So it's not a short-term reaction like predation. It's something that is evolved. It's something that is um, present over long periods of time. Uh, when two individuals are in a symbiosis, they are called symbionts. And so we can ask the question next is what are these relationship? And there is a, are several that we need to think about and we can define them by how organisms are affected by the relationship. So we have these six relationships here where we have competition, where two species, both species in this example are harmed. We have amensalism where one species is harmed and there's no effect on the second species. We have parasitism where one organism is harmed and the other organism has some sort of benefit to it. We have neutralism where there's no effect on either of them. They're basically just living together, not really interacting, but they're still a symbiote. Um, we have commensalism where there's no effect on one, but one organism gets a benefit. And then finally, the one we're gonna focus on primarily today, which is mutualism, where both organisms get some sort of benefit. And we've talked about this sort of, this mutualism a few times through class. We just never just put a name on it. Um, so we're going to talk, dive a little bit deeper into mutualism as a sort of a primary way to think about symbiosis because it's um, by far the most interesting aspect of mutual of uh, symbiosis by far. But let's talk a little bit about all these other ones. So first we have competition, which is interactions where both parties are harmed. And this is both within a species and between species competition. And we typically see it over some sort of limiting factor. It could be nutrients, it could be food, it could be space, it could be a mate. Um, um, and so you might, uh, microbes typically uh, generally resource or space limited, um, which leads to instances of competitive exclusion where a winner succeeds but a loser dies out. And many instances of competition are among microbes exist that we know of. Um, and so we've sort of talked about uh, sort of this aspect of competition in our biofilm lecture a little bit, but as biofilms progress, new members actually compete with existing members and the success of new colonizers does lead to successional patterns. Um, it's also a key reason why our skin microbes protect us. So for instance, on your skin itself, you have trillions of bacteria living on your skin and they live in your sweat pores and they live slightly below the surface of your skin. And they also live along your hair shafts and down along the follicles as well. And what these microbes do is actually they outcompete any foreign bacteria that try to land on you, thus protecting you. But ultimately, they are competing with other microbes as well. Um, and I also just will point out that uh, there are mites on your skin. So you're seeing uh, those mites on the base of your hair follicle. Everyone has mites on the base of their hair follicles, on their, on their hairs as well, as well as on their eyelashes, any, basically any hair on your body. Um, you will have microscopic mites crawling all over you. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for ruining your life by telling you that. 
Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about your skin microbiota in the next part of lecture. Um, next up is parasitism, which is where interactions where one species is harmed while the other benefits. It's a very, very common life cycle strategy for microbes as a whole. And there's tons and tons of examples across microbiology. And typically when we think about pathogens, um, that's a, this is the category that they really fit into. And even viruses are, have essentially are parasites um, with their hosts as well. Um, and there are, there are examples of parasites across all three domains of life. And the most classic example is actually malaria, which is caused by the, the parasitic tiny protist called pa uh, Plasmodium falciparum. And uh, what, what, the, what this does is it invades your blood cells via a mosquito bite. It infects your blood cells, preys upon them, and eventually kills them to consume them. And it has this whole life cycle that it goes through inside your body. So this is sort of a classic example of parasitism. And as we talked about with, in our global health lecture, this is actually one of the most common diseases that the world experiences on a year to year basis um, in the current and previous centuries. Commensalism is interactions where one party benefits and the other is unaffected. So it's like a ducks, it's like feeding ducks in the park, right? So they get the food, which is a benefit and you really don't get anything um, as a whole, I mean, you might get some enjoyment out of feeding ducks, but you actually aren't harmed either. Um, and you'll, you'll commonly hear our microflora, so the microbes that live on and inside us, described as commensal. Um, and uh, it's essentially this idea that it's a, it's a remnant in the literature of science that it was from when we thought that it, they didn't benefit us at all, but it is still something that is still used, even though it's not particularly accurate, as we'll see in the next part of lecture. But uh, we do see this in what we call in layered biofilms. So for those of you that remember back to our, our geochemistry class and our metabolism class, when we talked about when a grass key columns, um, one mi essentially one micro creates a byproduct of its normal metabolism. And this metabolic is used, this metabolite is used as a substrate for another microbe. So one is benefiting directly from the production of another microbe, but the other microbe that's producing it isn't actually harmed at all. Um, next up is mutualism, and this is the most exciting part, and uh, this is interactions where both species benefit, and we'll spend most of the rest of our time on these types of relationship, and there are tons and tons of awesome topics in the case of mutualism, and we've talked about a bunch of them, including this amazing uh, bobtail squid with its bioluminescent um, vibrio bacteria that lives in little sacs. Um, and they are really common all over biology in terms of mutualism. Species have been helping each other for a very, very long time. You know, the classic example for humans is us and dogs, right? But the sort of the most evolutionary important thing for humans is humans and their microflora, or even a dog in their microflora. And this is typically old, very old relationships. Most symbioses that we know, most mutualisms that we know of are millions and millions of years old at this point. So they're very, very, they have a very long history of evolutionary time together. And, they're, and they, they typically show what we call co-evolution, where the organisms sort of are evolving together as sort of one whole superorganism. So the genome of us is changing as well as the genome of this intercellular um, or potentially extracellular uh, mutualism, mutualistic uh, symbiont. And they are super important. They help maintain diversity. They make ecosystems function better and provide all sorts of services for humans to take advantage of. And many of these relationships are actually necessary for the survival of the symbionts. If you took away your symbiotic microorganisms, you would die, you know, probably very quickly simply because you couldn't get enough nutrients from your food. But one of the uh, most classic cases and one of the most successful biological entities on the planet is lichens. So these are those, those things that you see everywhere, but you didn't, actually, you didn't probably actually know what they are. Uh, they're found in pretty extreme environments, including tundra, deserts, inside rocks, but they're pretty much found in every ecosystem. You even find them inside, in, in Antarctica. So they're pretty much everywhere. And they're one of the first models to understand how microbes form symbiosis. It involves a fungus, which is what we call our mycobiont, and a photosynthetic organism called our, phyto, our photobiont. So typically if it's an algae, it's called a phycobiont, and this is the most common type of symbiont with a fungus. And the other type, about 10%, is a cyanobacteria, which is a cyanobiont. And essentially, uh, there's this really nice quote, is it lichen or fungi that have discovered agriculture? And that's basically what they are. And so the fungus provides the habitat, water, and nutrients to its phytobiont. What it does is it traps water and nutrients from the algae from the environment. The phytobiont then supplies fixed organic carbon and sugars to the fungus. 
And ultimately, the photobionts reside in a layer below the surface, nestled in a special fungal hyphae. And each photobiont is entwined by hyphae, and these special hyphae, which are called hostoria, penetrate the, the phyto phytobiont cell wall and extract nutrients. And this is sort of what uh, a nice sort of uh, cross section of our fungi look like, as well as their phytobionts. And you'll see we have the, the sort of the outer layer of this, all our symbionts. And you'll see that it has these little root like structures essentially uh, penetrating up into the algae to extract those nutrients, as well as exchange liquids with them. But uh, in, in a lichen, the fungus is an obligate participant in the symbiose. The, the, light, the fungus itself needs to be part of the symbiosis. It means if it lost its phytobiont, it will essentially die because it cannot physically produce its own food. Um, however, but the phytobiont itself is actually facultative, meaning it's able to live with or without this symbiosis. And so it's kind of interesting if you take the phytobiont outside of an algae and you grow it inside of a lab, it will actually grow better without the fungal part, the fungal counterpoint, counterpart. Um, some people argue this might actually be a case of parasitism where the, the fungi is parasitizing this um, phytobiont but, it's, but uh, there, there's probably some level of benefit here. It might not grow as fast, but that might not necessarily be the most important thing. Potentially something like protection is much, much better than say growing faster. Um, and these lichen can involve more than two organisms and they typically include multiple species of fungi. Um, we typically see common species of yeasts and there are also typically more than one species of phytobiont. And typically we see algae and cyanobacteria simultaneously. Um, and it's actually kind of a good thing because as we talked about with our, in our oceanic microbiology lecture, uh, cyanobacteria do have the capacity to fix nitrogen, which is good for this system. Um, that being said, there are other bacteria and fungi that will colonize this. Um, they'll colonize the outside of the fungi, they'll colonize the inside of the fungi as well. So it's sort of a really dynamic and fluid system. Next up, we're actually gonna talk about uh, <clears throat> Suzanthelli. And uh, zooxanthellae, uh, you probably have never heard of this, but they are photosynthetic symbionts that associate with many marine creatures, in particular coral, jellyfish, anemones, giant clams, radiolaria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these organisms are microeukaryotes. They are dinoflagellates, and they're typically from the genus Symbiodinium. Um, it's sort of interesting when they're associated with the host, they actually lose their flagella, which makes sense, simply because you don't need a flagella if you're living inside of a host. This is what they look like. They're not particularly exciting. You know, they're just little, par they're just little things, and they, and they colonize the inside of whatever they're looking at. In this case, we're looking at a very, very small uh, coral. As with lichen, they provide fixed carbon and sugars in exchange for safety and refuge. And these symbionts can live outside of the symbiosis. Um, however, when we're talking about corals, the corals are actually obligate and require the zooxanthellae. Um, but one, one of the things that actually happens um, is that these corals, again, they harbor these zooxanthellae inside. These corals are living animals. They're not rocks, they're not plants, they're actually living animals. And so that's why if you ever see coral, don't touch them, don't write on them. It's, it would be the functional equivalent of like scribing your signature on the the, you know, the, the belly of a cow or something like that. Um, so it's, uh, leave them alone if you see any coral. Um, we typically think of coral being uh, uh, tropical, but we do have coral here in Massachusetts. I'll just point that out because I think it's interesting. Um, that being said, these coral, again, they have an obligate symbiosis with these phytobiont. They provide the phytobiont with space and the phytobiont provides them with food, all the food that they can need. But one of the things that actually happens with corals, and this is something that's happening in the Great Barrier Reef all the time, and I'm sure you've heard about this phenomenon called coral bleaching. But what happens is corals and the polyps, um, which are the small, uh, sort of the larval phase of a coral, they'll actually expel their zooxanthellae um, in response to a stress. And this can be things like pH, temperature, or a physical disturbance. And this is what we call coral bleaching. And as you'll know, um, the, way, the idea being is uh, that if, uh, if a coral expels its symbiont, it, uh, it's trying to find a more stress tolerant species. Um, and so that's what it's trying to do. But as I'm sure you may have heard, um, if a coral does not get back at zooxanthellae and it stays bleached for an extended period of time, about four to six weeks, and it doesn't get a new symbiont, the coral will actually die permanently. 
So this is a phenomenon called coral bleaching. We see this all the time under current and future regimes of climate change. So for instance, by 2030, we expect to lose about 75% of corals worldwide. Um, in Australia, we see large amounts of coral bleaching um, every year. And this has some pretty deleterious effects on the ecosystems, but it also affects their tourism because people love to go see these corals. And again, this is all due to the breakdown of a symbiosis due to stress. Um, next up, and one we've discussed briefly, is root nodules, which is a symbiosis between a plant and a nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And these plants are typically legumes, beans, alfalfa, soybeans, peanuts, lentils, peas, and chickpeas. I always forget that peanuts are legumes and not anything else. Um, Nitrogen-fixing bacteria um, that they harbor as symbionts in their roots are called rhizobia, and there are many, many different types of these bacteria spread across the alpha and beta proteobacteria. And this is what a root nodule looks like. Inside the root nodule, they're just chock full of, of, uh, of these rhizobia, these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And uh, again, these, these nodules are found in legumes. Uh, they can be found in other species of plants, but legumes are best known for these symbionts. And there's sort of a uh, pretty consistent way these things happen. There's a root hair, it, there's an infection in the root hair by these bacteria, and then eventually produces this sort of nodule um, uh, with the bacteria forming coming inside. And one of the reasons they do this is because the bacteria um, are fixing nitrogen. And as you'll call, nitrogen fixation is an anaerobic process. And what these nodules do is they provide an anaerobic zone for these bacteria to live. And, what the, and so the bacteria is fixing nitrogen and it's giving that nitrogen to the plant. And the plant is in turn providing habitat as well as organic carbon and sugar. Um, both symbionts, um, in this case, both the plant and the bacteria are facultative, but they do much better together. So beans will say, uh, we're talking about something like a, uh, a bean plant, it will grow much larger in the presence of these rhizobia, these nodules, and the bacteria will actually grow better in the plant versus outside of the plant. So it is something that's facultative, um, but it is very beneficial to both hosts. And so we've been sort of talking about um, <clears throat> these uh, types of symbiosis, but there is two distinct types of endosymbiosis, of symbiosis, I should say, endo and ectosymbiosis. And so the examples above, one symbiont did, did live inside its host, um, but some symbiotic relationships involve species that live on or in its host. And so if your host, if your symbiont lives on you, it's an ectosymbiosis. And if your symbiont lives in you, it's an endosymbiosis. Um, so let's talk a little bit about endosymbiosis or living inside your symbiont. This is a common strategy when protection is one of the benefits afforded by the partner providing the habitat. And, the, and this is due because the microbes are so small and they're pretty, it's pretty easy for them to live inside of something. It's also pretty easy for them to get damaged living in nature. And there are tons and tons of examples out there. Guts, you know, your gut microbiome living inside you, the zooxanthellian coral, nitrogen fixing microbes and root nodules, as well as our beloved bobtail squid. Um, there are two modes of transmission of symbionts between host generations. We have, ho we have horizontal, which is where the symbiont is acquired from the environment. And this is the most common form of symbiosis among microbes and their host animals and plants. And then we have vertical uh, transmission, which is the symbiont is acquired from the mother or sometimes the father, but typically it's just the mother. And this is typical of what we call obligate symbionts. And this is particularly true in insects. So when an insect lays an egg or a clutch of eggs, it seeds the eggs with the symbiont. So its kids have the symbiosis, symbiont for the next generation. Um, endosymbionts, um, we've talked about zooxanthellae as well as um, our, 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 um, our rhizobium in these root nodules. So living in physically inside the bodies. So let's summarize this first part about symbiosis. So symbiosis encompasses many different interactions, including competition, commensalism, mutualism, and it's basically, remember, just a blanket definition for any interaction between two organisms. Historically speaking, it was just to describe a mutualism where two organisms benefit, but we do know now that it encompasses anything that, in, that is involved with interaction. Um, organisms can live on their host. Remember, that's the endo versus ecto symbionts and requires symbiosis to survive. And if you need symbiosis to survive, it's an obligate relationship 
or if you don't need symbiosis to survive, it's a facultative relationship. Um, and these relationships are very, very old and they show signs of co-evolution. And overall, mutualism is a very, very important part about, uh, of ecology. And it's also a very important part of, of your life on an everyday basis. Um, and it affects you in more ways than you can even begin to describe. But just to dive a bit more into symbiosis and how symbiosis affects you, we're actually gonna talk about the human microbiome, which is for us the most important symbiosis out there because our microbes, as I hope this lecture will illustrate you, are super duper important. I know many of you do not like microbes. You think microbes are gross. You think they're bad for you. Uh, and I know that the idea of being covered in microbes repulses you, but I hope by the end of this lecture, I can convince you of some of the amazing things that microbes do for you inside your body and how they help you be you. So for this part of the lecture, what we're going to be talking about, and we're going to try to answer these few questions, is what is the human microbiome and how does it change in different parts of the body? What are some of the key players that make up the human microbiome? And what is the useful function of our microbiota and how is it useful or beneficial to us? So let's start off with every microbiologist's favorite fun fact. This is something I like to sprinkle into casual conversation because I am a giant nerd. And this, this fun fact is that there are 10 times as many bacterial cells on and in you than in your own cells. Or of the cells that make up you, 90% are bacteria, which I think is sort of a weird way to think about it, right? If you have 10 trillion cells on you, 9 trillion of those are bacteria and only 10 trillion of those are your cells, right? Clearly your cells are bigger than the microbes, but uh, that's sort of a, a kind of a weird way to think about it. And so it leads you to ask the question, what are you really, microbe or human, if microbes actually outnumber you numerically? And this is something that you find in textbooks, including um, Brock's Microbiology of Microorganisms. You also find it in your course's textbook. It is a really, really prevalent fact. So let's talk a little bit about this. And so this concept dates back to 1972. There's this paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And they said an adult man carries 10 to the 12 microbes associated with his epidermis and 10 to the 14 microbes in his elementary tract. The latter number is based upon 10 to 11 microbes per grams of contents of an elementary tract with the capacity of approximately one liter. Fast forward to 2010, so about 10 years ago at this point, with the greatest diversity, uh, quantity and diversity found in the lower gastrointestinal tract, 100 trillion bacteria representing 100s of species. So this is sort of the evolution of this. Um, historically, it's gone through a lot of different things. Um, I'd recommend you read some of these things. It's a sort of a really interesting way to think about how an idea has evolved over time. But let's actually see if it's still a good estimate. Our sign, are we doing a good job? And so there was this paper that came out in 2016 from Sender et al. in Close Biology, revised estimates for the number of human and bacterial cells in the body. And what they did is they, uh, they, they went through sort of this multi-step process, and we're going to walk through it. And so the first question they asked is how many bacteria are there? And so what you'll notice is that this is a table that has different places. So the colon, dental plaque, small intestine, saliva, and so on and so forth. This is the typical concentration of bacteria in the numbers per milliliter. This is the volume in the order of magnitude bound for bacteria. And so what you'll notice is that some areas have very, very high density, but low volume. So your dental plaque has a very, very high density, but has a very low volume. However, other ones, other ones, like say your stomach, has a very high volume, but a very, very low density of bacteria. But what you will notice is that your colon, which is your large intestine, has a very high density of bacteria, the highest in your body, and it has the, one of the higher volumes uh, next to your small intestine. So what you'll notice is that the vast majority of bacteria on your body are about 10 to the 14 are actually found in your colon. And this is actually home to greater than 90% of bacteria found on and inside you. And so what we'll do is think, think about how to estimate our bacteria by thinking about how many colon microbes they are. Oops, wrong way. So the bacterial density, they can be, they can be uh, determined inside your body through direct counts with microscopy, as well as some molecular and other micros microscopy uh, methods. We get about uh, 0.29 times 10 to the 11th bacteria per gram, plus or minus 19%. If we take the colon volume by using x-rays, autopsies, and MRIs, we know that the colon is typically about 0.41 liters, plus or minus 17%. So if we do some math, 
we, we take our amount of bacteria, we multiply it by the volume, we get about 3.8 times 10 to the 13 bacteria, or about 38 trillion, which is pretty close to what we saw in that table over there. Next up, we want to estimate how many human cells there are. And so if you look at a, a uh, not a pie chart, but a, a chart breaking down how, how many cells you have and what types of cells break down uh, or break, uh, break down that uh, your composition of cells. You'll notice that we have all in this graph, we have all sorts of different types of cells. Um, for a total cell count, we have between, uh, we have about 30 times 10 to the 12 cells, but you'll notice that our erythrocytes or our blood cells, they contribute, um, What you notice is that the vast majority of your cells are actually your blood cells. So of those cells, about 84% are your blood cells. And so what we can do is use a similar density times volume calculation. So we'll, we'll focus on your red blood cells because they, they actually have the most of your cells. So you have five times 10 to the 12 cells per liter and the average humor, human has approximately 4.9 liters of blood. So we do that multiplication and we get a number of approximately um, 2.5 times 10 to the 13 human cells. Altogether, we get a total of about three times 10 to the 13 human cells or about 30 trillion cells. So let's look at the ratio. So again, we have 3.8 times 10 to the 13 bacteria, three times 10 to the 13 human cells, which puts us at about a one to one ratio. And that is uh, disappointing for uh, your average everyday microbiologist, um, but it is something that is actually fairly consistent across population segments. So what you can look at um, is uh, are this little table, oops, sorry, this little table at the bottom where we have a, several different people. We have their, um, their total, uh, oops, I'm so sorry, their total bacterial composition down here, and we have the total bacteria times 10 to the 12, total red blood cell, times 10 to the 12, and they match up pretty well. Um, so what we're seeing is that this is actually something that's pretty consistent across populations. This is actually due to the amount of blood you have and your colon content actually tend to co-vary, meaning as you have more blood, you typically have more colon content. So. Um, so let's, so, so the, the idea being here is that we are in about a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, fun fact, if you go poop, you'll actually skew that ratio to being more bacteria than human. So when we think about our microbiome, we live in about a one-to-one -one ratio of our microbes. There's about 30 trillion bacteria. There's about 30 trillion of our cells. So we're at about a 50-50 split on that 60 trillion total cells. But let's talk about some new fun facts. We are still outnumbered by bacteria. It's closer to one-to-one -one ratio. We can still typically use that 10 to one ratio if we use the caveat that we're only counting nucleated cells. And some people um, argue if, tr if red blood cells are actually true cells simply because most of them lack a nucleus. Uh, we do have an estimated about 2.2 kilograms of bacteria, which is about the size and mass of a softball if you were to sort of compress it together. And uh, as I mentioned, a defecation event can shift the balance to more human than bacterial cells. So if you take a poop, um, or if you don't poop, it'll allow you to take back your humanity um, or get rid of your humanity um, by pooping or not pooping. And I'm sure that's what you all wanted to hear when you started watching this lecture. So let's talk about these 38 trillion microbes and why is there so many and why do we care? So our microbes that live on us are microbiota. So the, when we're thinking about the individual microbes, those are our microbiota, but collectively thinking of them as a group or thinking of them as the genetics um, and the, the thousands of genomes inside you, they are your microbiome. Um, historically speaking, they were called microflora, but that's a really old thing. We don't really use microflora anymore. It's either microbiota or microbiome. And this consists of all the organisms, which include bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, sometimes archaea, um, and sometimes other, um, other microbes, including sometimes we have viruses. Um, but uh, when we're thinking about our microbiome, the one that is actually the most important here is actually our bacteria. Of all your microbiome, bacteria comprise about 95 to 98% of your normal microbiome. And these microbes, when they live on and inside you, it is typically a harmless association with the human body. And microbiomes 
have a pretty storied history. It dates back to, as you'll remember, Von Leeuwenhoek and his animacules in the 1670s. If you remember, he took scrapings of his teeth to look at bacteria under his microscopes. Because remember, he's the guy that invented these really awesome microscopes and he was a jerk because he didn't share them. And then remember what he did is he drank really hot coffee and then he looked at his microbes under the microscope after drinking coffee to see how hot things killed the microbes in his mouth. Um, in the 1970s, uh, because there was actually a lot of uh, sort of developments on this in between, um, we became aware that microflora are important and outnumbered our cells. In the 2000s, we actually sort of realized that there was a need to focus on our resident microbes and not just them as, as their pathogens. Because um, as many of you probably think of microbes, um, historically speaking, before modern times, before the 2000s, um, we just considered microbes to be bad, to be pathogenic. And that's something that still pr is pervasive throughout society. But we know that microbes are not just pathogens and they are critically important. And this turning and thinking started again in the 2000s. Um, we published um, the Human Genome Project in 2001, where we sequenced the first human genomes. And one, one of the things that we actually realized while we were doing this is that many of the gene products that we are finding inside of our intestines, as well as our blood, weren't actually physically made by our own genes. So this really said, okay, our bacteria are actually doing meaningful things inside us because we're finding their gene products, their byproducts, their metabolism products inside of our body. So it means that these microbes are actually doing things. And it really took till the 2000s for molecular tools, in particular DNA sequencing, to actually physically catch up with our research goals and to understand this. Um, modern microbiome history um, has, has sort of had has two distinct parts, as with all microbiology. So we've always been able to culture microbes from our bodies. So the, pretty much every um, microbe that you work with in the lab were actually isolated from the human body. So this includes bacteria like Staph epidermis that was isolated from our epidermis or skin, um, E. coli, which is a gut bacteria, um, and many, many others, including Pseudomonas and so on and so forth. So all these bacteria we've been working in the lab were actually cultured from human subjects. Um, but our culture-independent techniques, as we've talked about, um, have dramatically expanded our capacity to characterize our microbiome. And we'll see uh, <clears throat> all the publications that have resulted as a, salt of, as a, as a uh, result of this um, and there's many, many more that are coming out and many, many more there. So this sort of changes in um, our publication. So we can look at all publications of all time, looking at microbiome research. Um, so from 2011 to 2016, there was 10,000 papers published just on the colon and gut microbiome. And if you look at all time, there's 17,000. So over half of the papers were published after sort of this microbiome research revolution in the 2000s. Um, but this microbiome research revolution was really spearheaded by the Human Microbiome Project, which is this big push through the National Institutes of Health uh, here in the United States to characterize the healthy human microflora using molecular tools, in particular sequencing. Um, we have our own Human Microbiome Project, and there has been similar projects across the world, including in Europe, as well as in China and other parts of the world. Um, and what this human microbiome project did is sought to identify a core set of microbial taxa universally present in healthy individuals. The idea being that the absence of such microbes would indicate a dysbiosis or an imbalance in our microbiota and would thus be indicative of disease. Um, as if you may recall from sort of when we talked about sequencing, they, they typically use 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, as well as whole genome sequencing of micro, microbial isolates to study these microbes. This is something that began in 2008 with $150 million from funding in the NAS, from the NIH and has received many, many more millions of funding uh, since then. And so the original microbiome project started by sampling 300 individuals ranged 18 to 40 years old, and each person was sampled one to three times um, on 15 or sometimes 18 locations on their body, which in total led to over 11,000 samples. And the sites they sampled, including several places inside the mouth, the nose, the skin, the GI tract, as well as the urogenital tract. Um, um, you know, thinking about the, the, the vaginal cavity as well as the penis. And this ultimately resulted in a ton of data. 
we sequenced greater than 2,300 genomes of bacteria and generated 14.23 terabytes of data. Just to put that in perspective, these, this, typically these video recordings are about 100 megabytes worth of data. A terabyte is uh, a thousand, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 10,000 times that much data. So it's a ton, ton of data. And so the question we can actually ask, if you're dumping this much money into generating all this data, what the heck did they find? Um, and unsurprisingly, they found that different sampling locations have different communities. So if you remember um, from our microbial methods section, this is a principal coordinates analysis. Each point here is a, is a representation of an individual microbial sample. And the closer two points are together, say like these two points here, are very, very similar in their microbial community composition, whereas two points that are very far apart, like say this one and this one, have very, very different microbial communities. And what you notice on this graph, we have our gastrointestinal communities here in purple, well, dark purplish, our urogenital samples here in, in light purple, skin in green, oral in orange, and nasal in red. And what this really tells us, because we see some pretty distinct clustering by location, is that no, depending on where you go in your body, you have different microbes. I think that intuitively makes sense, right? Your GI tract is a very different habitat than your skin. Your mouth is a very different habitat than, say, your nose. They're very, very different despite being in relatively close proximity to one another. Um, but what you'll notice is there is some overlap, including your skin and your nose. Um, but what's interesting that there's, even though there's overlap between your skin and your nose, there's no overlap between your nose and your, your general tract or your gastrointestinal tract. Um, and there does seem to be a lot more variability in skin and mouth samples, and there's very little variability in the GI tract as well. And I think that makes sense, right? Your GI tract is inside you, and it's really only subjected to your food, whereas your skin and your mouth probably changes on a pretty consistent basis, as well as your nose, right? Because they're, ex they're exposed to the environment around them. Um, and what we did notice is from all these samples, there are a number of key phyla, and the human microbiome is comprised of less than 10 um, phyla, and it's typically dominated by six. And so the 10 phyla um, that our microbiome is dominated by include these 10, um, and depending on where you are in the body, one, one phyla of bacteria will dominate over, an, over another. Um, <clears throat> and these are not the only 10 phyla of bacteria that are found on you, but uh, other phyla are in very, very low abundance, so less than 0.01%, so one one hundredth of a percent, and they seem to be um, sort of just hitchhikers. They're something that just landed there and it was found inside you, um, as opposed to being something that's like a meaningful symbiont of you. And what we did is we actually found some really interesting things about diversity, and so remember diversity simply refers to the amount of microbes a microbial species present. If something is very diverse, it has a lot of microbial species. And what we did observe is that not all taxa were observed to be universally present among all body, bodily habitats and individuals. And there was diversity that varied by location. So for instance, sal your saliva had the highest number of species found, um, but one of the lowest bedded diversities. Um, and so the, the idea here is that although each individual saliva was ecologically rich in microbes, members of the population still shared very similar organisms. Um, conversely, your skin had the highest beta diversity, but were immediately, uh, but were intermediate in alpha, alpha diversity. So there was a high degree of, of um, diversity in terms of between habitats as opposed to within a single habitat. Um, and we can look at microbiota comparing between different animals. And so this is looking at the intestinal microbiota. You'll see that the vast majority come from those ones that we've been talking about, so the bacteria DTs, the firmicutes, and so on and so forth. And we can actually see that between different animals, whether it's humans, mice, cattle, and pig, we actually share a very similar set of microbes um, between all these different mammals. So it seems to be that there is some sort of core mammalian microbiome across different uh, intestinal tracts, um, which seems to be that it might be something that uh, implies that there was a, there's an evolutionary relationship here, that maybe something that our common ancestor between all four of us colonized that original one, and it's simply just been passed down over time. But uh, with that out of the way, let's dive into some specific biomes. And we're going to start off with the least diverse of all your microbiomes, and this is going to be your gastric microbiome. 
Um, <clears throat> And so this was something that really sort of took a foothold in the 80s. And uh, in particular, it was the discovery of Helicobacter pylori inside your acidic gastric environment. And for the longest time, there was this, this sort of this dogma that the stomach was sterile. The fact that your stomach was so acidic that no bacteria could physically live in your stomach. But we actually know that's not the case. And actually, we know that Helicobacter pylori and several other species of bacteria will actually physically colonize your stomach. And uh, you might not have heard of Helicobacter pylori before. It's actually associated with gastric ulcers. It was discovered by Dr. Barry Marshall in the 1980s. And it's sort of interesting um, what he did to discover that uh, Helicobacter pylori caused ulcers and what he won the Nobel Prize for is he took he essentially ingested a culture of Helicobacter pylori. He got ulcers, then took antibiotics to, to cure himself of the Helicobacter pylori infection, and his ulcers actually went away, thus proving that ulcers and uh, Helicobacter pylori were associated with one another and winning him the Nobel Prize. Um, that being said, for those, of them, for those of us that do not have Helicobacter pylori, um, the gastromicrobiota is actually pre has pretty high diversity. But when Helicobacter is present, Helicobacter typically dominates the community of your stomach, comprising about 90% of all bacteria in your stomach. Um, but as you'll remember, you only have about 10,000 bacteria per milliliter in your stomach. It's not particularly a very um, abundant group of microbes. And as you'll notice, it's not a particularly very diverse group of microbes. Um, that being said, before we move on to talking about other places, I want to just mention that Helicobacter pylori, it does cause ulcers, but that typically um, doesn't mean Helicobacter is a bad microbe. It's actually a pretty important microbe for your stomach as a whole. Um, just, to, just as a note, I know, I know I said it causes ulcers, but it is, it is actually good for you. Um, it typically, you just need a bad version of Helicobacter to cause some serious problems. Next up is the gut microbiome. And this is, as we've talked about, is the largest number and density and has the greatest variety of species compared to other bodily habitats on and inside you. Most, if not all of the taxa um, inside your stomach belong to two phyla. Those are the firmicutes and the and bacteroid DT. So it's a very, um, it has a lot of species diversity, but it's in terms of the phyla presence, it's actually pretty low diversity. Um, when we jump in and we look at the firmicutes, most of the bacteria actually are a member of the genus Clostridia. Um, we've talked about Clostridia uh, a few times um, throughout this course, um, just sort of in spot cases. Um, when we think about uh, our Bacteroidetes, um, we have either the genus Bacteroidetes or the genus Prevotella. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, Western cultures, uh, more industrialized nations have more Bacteroidetes, much more um, less well-off places, or say even indigenous populations have more Prevotella inside their colon. Um, and both of these are obligate anaerobes, meaning once you poop them out, they are likely to die because of the oxygen. But the GI tract is actually has some pretty interesting uh, development over time from when you were born to when you were adult. So this GI tract is actually initially colonized by the genera of bacteria called lactobacillus. And you might remember back from our food microbiology lecture, this genus of bacteria is a lactic acid fermenter, is responsible for creating yogurt. They're also used as probiotics. And uh, these, these bacteria are typically uh, colonized via from birth, um, from the birth canal, as well as from your mother's milk, if you are breastfed. Um, and within the first year of life, there's an estimated 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 mi microbes comprising to 500 to 1,000 species colonizing your gastrointestinal tract. Uh, after you wean off formula or breast milk, the gut microbiota does become firmly established, leading to a lifelong microbiome signature in healthy individuals. Um, the gene, the gut firmicutes and bacteroidetes actually do not physically grow outside of the host, and they actually rely on close contact of your parents and offspring for transmission. So essentially, your parents are seeding you with your microbiome. And so just as a contrast, uh, something like Vibrio cholera needs an environmental reservoir, but your gut microbiome comes actually from your parents. And it's actually really interesting. Um, you, you can actually look at the microbes inside you, and they're actually more similar to your mother than they are to your father. You, you typically get more of your microbes from mom rather than dad. And um, 
And so the question is, why would having a large diversity of microbes be a good thing for farmers? Why would it be a good thing for humans? Well, um, typically high diversity of microbes is a good thing. And <clears throat> as we change our lives, we change our diversity of microbes. And sort of the interesting things about your microbiome, depending on where you live, if you live in, say, a remote hunter-gatherer population, you have a much more diverse group of microbiomes than, say, a group of farmers, or even compared to, say, a Western European, uh, Western or European diet. Um, sort of interesting. You you decrease as you become more urbanized, more advanced. You actually decreased. Um, your overall microbial diversity. And one of the things we know about microbial diversity is that typically more diverse your microbes are, the better your gut functions. Um, and this is ultimately due to just how varied the diet is of someone that is say a hunter gatherer versus a uh, farming or fishing population, conversely versus a Western diet where we eat lots of things that are high fat, high sugar, and take things like antibiotics and other medicines that can affect your microbes. But um, uh, our, our gut microbiome, again, is comprised of a very small number of species. So the, the firmicutes and the bacteria, DTs, as a whole. Um, just as a note, uh, C and D are a bit atypical of our microbes. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, A and D are, have a little bit strange microbial communities. Uh, C and D are much more typical of what we see. The vast majority of your gut being comprised of firmicutes and secondary of bacteria DTs. And if we look at uh, sort of a phylogenetic tree of our firmicutes, what, you, what we see here is that the vast majority of our microbes inside of our gut actually come from this area of the tree of the firmicutes and not so much over here. Um, and the gut microbiome as a whole, um, and we've talked about sort of who's there. The next question we can ask is what the heck are they doing? And they actually play an integral role to host digestion and nutrients. And they can generate nutrients from substrates that are otherwise indigestible from the host. So very much, many, much of what you eat, you physically as a human without your microbiome could not digest and extract nutrients from. And so if you ate something like a salad, you would actually poop most of that lettuce out whole if it wasn't for the microbes inside your stomach. You simply, from your colon and your stomach, you simply cannot extract and break down that material. And so you do rely heavily on your microbes to extract and break down your food. And from this, they actually generate some pretty common um, uh, things that we need. And so for instance, uh, xyloglucans, which are commonly found in vegetables, such as onions and lettuce, um, our, our, um, our capacity to that is actually zero as humans, we cannot physically digest xyloglycans, but there are members of the phylum bacteria, DTs, um, that can break this down, and it's a relatively rare trait in the bacteria, DTs. Um, however, though 92% of people that contained at least one of these bacteria, DT species, is actually capable of, of digesting those xyloglycans. So they do allow us to digest things we wouldn't normally be able to digest otherwise. More importantly, microbes, I guess not more importantly, another thing microbes can do is they can actually liberate short chain fatty acids from indigestible dietary fibers. So things like <clears throat> what a uh, short chain fatty acid is include things like acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Um, these are the most common. And they're an important energy source for our, actually our intestinal, intestinal mucosa. Um, and so thinking about our lining, um, in particular acetate, and they're actually critical for modulating the immune response in your gut. And again, without bacteria, we wouldn't be able to get this function from our food. And the other important thing that microbes do is they actually synthesize vitamin B, uh, many of our vitamin Bs, and vitamin K inside of us. Uh, fun fact, humans used to be able to synthesize vitamin B and vitamin K at one point, but because of our evolutionary relationship with our microbes, we've actually lost the capacity to do that. So um, in terms of function, uh, our gut, the genes in our gut actually outnumber ours by about 150 times. So if we look at our genes, there's about, you know, 23,000 or so. We know that inside of our gut, there's about 5 million genes from our microbes. And this allows our microbes to break down many more, many of the potential energy sources that we consume. So for instance, um, in the absence of microbes in, right, in mice and rats, um, 
that lack a gut flora, they actually need to eat 30% more calories just to remain at the same weight as their normal counterpoints, simply because without their microbiota, they actually physically can't extract enough energy from their food. Um, and this typically includes the digestion of starches, fiber, oligosaccharides, as well as sugars that the body, your body simply cannot digest and extract energy from. So that's the gut microbiome. Again, really important for your nutrition and overall health. Uh, let's move on next to the skin, which is your largest organ, which is about 1.8 square meters of physical space. Um, as many of you probably know, this acts as a physical barrier to pathogens in the environment as a whole. And, at, and part of the reason it can do this is provides is because it provides a nice home to our resident microbiota. Your skin has about 10 to the 10 bacteria on it, or about 1 million per square centimeter, or about you know, 2 or 3 per square inch. 2 or 3 million, that is, not 2 or 3 bacteria per square inch. Uh, the skin flora colonization typically begins at birth. So if you are passed vaginally, um, I'm sorry, you were born vaginally, um, you are essentially seeded by your mother's vaginal microbiome as you exit the birth canal, as well as through skin-to-skin -skin contact once you leave. It's actually kind of interesting. Those that are born, born via cesarean section actually have a different skin microbiome than those that are born through typical uh, vaginal birth. Um, but your initial skin microbiome is actually very similar to your mother's vaginal microbiomes. Um, as I mentioned, this is something that's not true for C-section babies because they do not pass through the birth canal. Um, early microbiomes, very much like the vaginal microbiome, is actually dominated by species of lactobacillus. Um, and within days, your skin microflora starts to actually be dominated by more typical uh, streptococcus and staphylococcus, which resemble a more adult skin microbiome. So it doesn't take very long for your skin to uh, essentially um, he start heading towards adulthood. And by the time you're about two years old, your microflora is fully mature and looks like an adult. Um, but it does start very, very early where you're starting to get adulty microbes like strep and staphylococcus colonizing a young child's skin. Um, but relative to other parts of your body, the skin is a really tough place to live. Um, the skin is most often referred to as like a desert. It doesn't have a lot of nutrients. It's often dry. It has pretty large swings in temperature and all other sorts of environmental conditions. It's a really tough place to live. The skin is typically cooler than the inside of your body. It's typically acidic. There's not a lot of water. Um, and it's typically pretty salty, right, you, from sweat, whether or not you realize you're sweating or not. Um, it has very low nutrients. Typically, uh, the only thing that is out there is uh, is from typically from things that you're secreting, including your peptides and uh, sebum from your skin, as well as fats from your skin. Uh, the other thing that, about your skin is it's it's chock full of antibacterial molecules produced by the microbes living on you, as well as your own skin. Um, these include things like free fatty acids, as well as antimicrobial peptides, and sometimes antibiotics. And um, <clears throat> one other thing your skin does is it produces lots of lysozyme, which attacks peptidoglycan, which as you should remember from the biofilms lecture, is, is a really important component of biofilms. Um, when we're thinking about the distribution of bacteria on your skin, um, the sweat glands are the primary location of your skin bacteria. There's about 10 to the 12 microbes in these moist and nutrient-rich areas. Um, and the nutrient-rich things we're thinking about are typically like urea, as well as amino acids and lipids. Um, in these areas, there's about 180 different species of bacteria. They're mostly anaerobic because your sweat glands, sweat glands are typically anaerobic. Um, and the vast majority of bacteria on your skin are gram-positive. And one of the reasons this is, is because, and as you should remember from the lab section where we looked at mannitol salt agar, is that gram-positive bacteria actually can tolerate high salt concentrations, whereas gram-negative bacteria really can handle high salt concentrations. And your skin has a chock, has, has chock full of salt here. Um, and again, gram-positive do tolerate salt well because of that very thick cell wall. Um, the, oops, one of the most common bacteria we see is Staphylococcus epidermis. This is something we've worked with in the lab before. Um, and another really common bacteria is Propionibacterium. Um, it's actually recently renamed to Curtobacterium. Um, and this bacteria actually has the capacity to degrade skin oil, which can cause inflammation of your sebaceous glands and actually causes acne. And so this is actually the bacteria that causes acne, Propionibacterium acne.
kind of a derp. So let's look at the skin microflora a little bit more in depth. <clears throat> And so the normal skin microflora includes both bacteria and yeast, but as we've been mentioning, the vast majority of your microbes on you are, are bacteria. Yeasts are there, but it's mostly bacteria. Um, the microorganisms there that are, are typically adapted to the salty and slightly acidic environment inside of your sweat glands, so down here underneath your skin. Um, there are those that are growing on your skin, but the action is down below the skin. Um, the, the, the bacteria we find inside of our skin, including includes staph and, strep, strep, staph and streptococcus, as well as corneobacteria and propionibacteria. And the gram-positive bacteria actually predominate on the surface of your skin itself, um, again, because of their thick cell wall protects, protects against the salt, as well as them drying out. Because remember, your skin is... Um, your skin is pretty uh, salty, it's pretty dry on an everyday basis. Even if you lotion up, uh, your skin is pretty dry. Um, as I've mentioned, the skin microflora actually is the first line of defense from pathogens invading your skin. And these cause disease by limiting nutrients available for pathogens, as well as limiting the amount of space a pathogen could particularly land on them. Land, I'm sorry, land on you. Essentially, a pathogen needs to be able to outcompete your microbiota if it's actually physically going to colonize and infect you. Um, our microflora also increases the acidity of the skin, making it much more inhospitable to pathogens. And this is due simply because of bacterial fermentation. And as we talked about in the food microbiology lecture, bacterial fermentation does lower the acidity of the environment, which actually prevents most pathogens from growing, which is why fermented foods, as you'll remember, are typically much safer than non-fermented foods. Um, and unsurprisingly, depending on what part of your skin you look at, there are different microbes present. But your skin is broken down into three different types. So sebaceous, which is your oily skin. You're thinking about like creases, you know, the, the T-zone on your face, um, things like that. Uh, moist areas, you're thinking about the groin and the armpits. And then uh, and the crease of your buttocks as well. Um, that can also be a, seba a sebaceous area, I will note. Um, as well as the bottom of your feet are pretty, are pretty wet, as well as in between your toes. And then the dry areas are pretty much everywhere else, places that are not particularly oily. Um, but as you'll notice of this chart of this um, human person, uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, each one of these uh, colors corresponds to a different group of bacteria down here. And we have different types of glands. So sebaceous are green, I'm sorry, blue here. Moist areas are in, in green and dry areas are in red. And what you notice is that depending on where you look, you have different microbes. But within these different types of areas, similar casts of microbes will live. So if you look at, say, um, within these sebaceous areas here, they all have a very similar group of propioni bacteria, um, which makes sense. They're in a similar location, similar environment. And so remember, the environment really does select for which microbes can physically grow in a given area. Um, so in addition to sort of this within person variability, there is a decent amount of person to person variability. And so we can look at um, this experiment that, that came out uh, a number of years ago at this point, but we have person one, two, three, four, and that's the same across all four of these panels. We're looking at uh, four locations on the body. But what you notice is that uh, within a, between people, within a given location, it's actually pretty similar. So this, uh, this instance here, where we're looking at the um, antipicutal fossa, we're looking at an oily area of your body, very, very similar microbes, similar in the back, similar in the nose, similar on the heel, right? But one of the things that's actually interesting is if you look at person one here, if you compare its uh, antipicutal fossa, to, its, to their back, it's very, very different. So the, the, actually the thing that we find is that my armpit would be more similar to your armpit in terms of the microbial composition than my armpit is to my back. And so there's variability between people, but that's still, uh, my armpit is gonna be more similar to your armpit than your back is to your armpit. It's actually a really, really interesting thing. And again, it's simply because the habitats are so similar our armpits are gonna have very similar habitats and they're gonna be very different than the habitats on our back for these microbes. One um, of the other things that we know um, about our microbes, um, sort of moving on from our, um, our, our talk about the skin is how microbes are, in, are linked to the health of individuals. And so there's a really strong link between microbial uh, diversity 
and the presence of certain microbes in obesity. And I think this intuitively makes sense. Um, those that are, uh, that are obese, that are very large, they have very different diets than those that are, say, lean. And so what they, so they have, there's this really nice experiment that came out in 2006. And what they did is they fed, uh, they had 12 obese patients. They fed one, of, one or two diets for one year, and they compared the gut flora to lean patients. And what they did learn is that we had uh, percentages of total sequences here, weeks on diet, and we have firmicutes and bacteria DTs. So these people are spending, you know, originally they have very high amount of firmicutes, but over time you'll notice is that the amount of firmicutes actually decreases. And what we're seeing is actually an increase in bacteria DTs. And what we're seeing is that the longer these obese people were on a diet, they actually started approaching levels uh, of bacteria DTs and firmicutes that were similar to lean people. And what this applies is that there's pretty strong evidence that microbes um, and your weight are actually linked together, whereby your microbes can actually make you more obese or your microbes can actually help you be leaner. And so this has spawned some really cool research looking at um, what, what will happen if you feed people, say, uh, a different diet along with, say, a probiotic to potentially get them to have a microbiome that resembles, say, a leaner person. Um, and again, it does suggest some new type of potential treatment to help people with obesity, which is a very big deal here in the United States as a whole. Um, in addition, there's some pretty strong linkage between your microbiota and cognitive function. And so this ties back to this, um, what we call the microbiome gut brain access. And the idea being is that your microbes inside your colon can actually stimulate nerves inside your body through the production of certain compounds that will then go on to alter your behavior. So for instance, if you eat McDonald's every day for a week, um, in subsequent weeks, you're, you will actually crave McDonald's because the microbiome inside your colon is actually stimulating your nerves to get you to eat more fatty foods like the McDonald's that you were eating. So your microbes can actually have a direct effect on your behavior. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting. There's this effect of, of how timid you are versus how adventurous you are and how tenacious you are. And so this is a really nice experiment that came out in 2014 where that mice that were fed antibiotics actually became more adventurous um, because it made, um, it made their microbiome change and thus could alter their behavior, um, which is actually really kind of a freaky thing to think about for a human. Um, and uh, it's one of the interesting things. It seems to be a nervous response, a nerve level response from these microbes. But the gut is ultimately linked to your brain as your brain is linked to everything in your body. And it's particularly very complicated. Um, and it's something that I will fully admit I'm, I don't have a full understanding of, but there is a vagus nerve that goes down from your brain to your gut. And um, there's all sorts of um, immune systems and in, in, uh, pituitary in your hypothalamus and all sorts of things involved. Um, there's all sorts of things involved in the system. Um, it gets really, really complicated, but there's ultimately this feedback and control that between your brain and your gut that controls hunger, salivation, mood, digestion, and lots, lots more. So there is this direct crosstalk between your gut and your brain, as well as the microbes in your brain, because they can say, uh, essentially uh, create a compound that goes inside your cells, which stimulates this nerve, which goes to your brain. And as you know, your brain controls everything about you. So there is this really strong connection between the gut and the brain. And there's all sorts of crazy things in this field of microbiology that I wish I had time to talk about, but we would be here for hours if I did. So. Um, but again, microbes do play a large role in the interactions of your gut and your brain. And they produce a wide, wide range of neuroactive compounds, including uh, acetylcholine, histamine, melatonin, serotonin, which are essentially uh, essential regulators um, for all parts, all parts of your body, as, but as well as for regulating um, prostalsis and sensation in your gut as a whole. Um, but ultimately, the brain uh, in response will send signals that do modulate the gut microbial community com composition by altering the activity and expression of gut epithelial cells, as well as by altering what foods you eat. Um, so it's a really interesting thing. Uh, the other thing that's sort of been linked to this is that a dysbiosis in your gut, again, a, a deviation from the normal gut microbiome, has actually been linked to all sorts of cognitive conditions, including major depressive disorder. So in, ex in an experiment, mice that were transplanted with uh, gut microbes from healthy mice versus uh, major depressive disorder mice, 
um, uh, we saw that in that experiment that mice that got uh, microbes from major depressive disorder mice displayed more levels of anxiety as well as depression. We know there is all sorts of sleep issues associated because the microbes in our gut actually follow our circadian rhythms as well as their own. And so any alterations in their patterns or our patterns can alter our sleep as well as our microbes downtime as well. Uh, there's also been some linkage between autism in our gut microbiome. And so autistic children more likely than not have atypical gut microbes relative to non-autistic children. And the diagnosis of autism actually occurs around the same time the gut microbiome matures. So there might be a link between autism and your microbiome, um, but definitely not a link between autism and vaccines. I know I said that during the vaccines lecture, but I'm just going to say it again because it bears repeating. So. Um, and with that, that's going to be the end of this lecture. I hope you all learned something about your microbiome and the wacky and crazy world of microbial ecology of your body. I hope you have a greater appreciation for how microbes affect you and how essential they are to your everyday life. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to answer them. And I hope you all are doing well. Take